All right, and welcome back. So I finished the last lecture talking about the couple of different options that you had for printing out summary statistics. And we're specifically kind of focusing on the mean and the median. Okay, but what are the measures of central tendency? Well, first one we're gonna cover is the mean. Okay. Everybody knows what the average is, right? So the mean is the sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. So you can denote this as M for mean, which is the more traditional APA style or X bar, which is the more traditional math style. But either way, we'd add up all the scores and divide by the total number of scores. So if I add up all of the magnitudes of our earthquakes and divide by the number of earthquakes, we get 4.6. You can do that with the mean function, which we've seen a couple times. But we also saw it in all the summary functions. So I only use the mean function when that's the only thing I want. Now the median here is the middle score. So I put all of my scores in order and then pick the one that's right in the middle because that's a different way to define the middle. So what the mean does is it finds the middle by balancing like a seesaw. So the mean is biased by outlier scores, scores that are way far from either end because you have to seesaw them and you know, kind of control for how uh, large or small those numbers are. And so the mean is not, an even number of scores on each side, that's the median. The mean is an even weight of scores on each side. Right? So the larger side counts for more weight. Um, whereas the median is an even number of literal scores on each side. Now these two are very similar, 4.6, 4.62. With distributions that are more symmetric, the mean and the median come closer together. So in a normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the last one we'll talk about, the mode, are all usually very close together or exactly the same. In a perfect distribution, they'd be exactly the same. I have made up distribution. Um, but the closer they are together, the more that tells you that it's less, there's less skew and less, uh, at least less skew, right? With kurtosis, um, that's still kind of, tr you know, the mean, median, and mode might still be the same, but at least it tells you something about the skew. Now the mode is the definition, uh, the definition is the most frequent score. And we can have multiple modes. And there's no good like mode function. This is sort of one of the weird missing things. And so you can kind of create these like table functions and pick the highest frequency. So you can create a frequency table and pick the ones that are with the highest. We've got like kind of a, a special written one here that you can cut and paste because that is how good coding works, right? So we can use this function. To, to calculate the mode and we get 4.5. Now we calculated a frequency table quite some time ago and 4.5 is the one with the largest frequency. But this is error prone. So we just have to be careful to pick to, if we have um, a bunch of numbers to pick the one that is the most frequent. Now there may, no, may not be any really good mode per se. So if you're looking at a, a frequency distribution, and unless you have one bar for each possible score, you may not know kind of what the mode is. And if we have dis distributions with a lot of decimals, modes don't make a lot of sense. But it is a way to, get to measure the middle, because if it's the most frequent score, it's going to be one of the most um, the kind of the tallest bar, if you will. There's a wrinkle here that we might end up with what's called a bimodal distribution, where there's clearly two peaks. Now, one of these may be, you know, the frequency may be 200, and this may be 201, so you technically only have one mode. But visually, this kind of double peaked distribution is, tends to be called bimodal distribution. Okay. And those are symmetric. Okay. And, and sometimes they'll give you good kurtosis scores too, but they're just missing this in the middle, basically. A multimodal distribution has several modes or it has more than more than two humps, camel wise. Okay, so that's why you always make the picture first because the picture will help tell you like, oh, there's two modes here. So which measure of central tendency should I use when? Okay. If the variable is nominal, right? Binary or, or nominal, so categorical, the, the best solution is to use the mode because there is no mean. I can't calculate the average 
professorness or the average gender, right? Those are, those are not numbers, they're, they're labels. So the mode makes the most sense. If it's ordinal, you, the median is usually a good one because you, um, they have an order to them. So you pick the ones in the middle, okay, if that makes sense. You can also use the mode for an ordinal distribution. An interval and ratio data that is not skewed, the mean, an interval and ratio data that is skewed, the, the median. Okay, so an example of a, a common use of the median is for income. Income is a heavily skewed distribution. It's positive skew because there are lots of low scores and only a few high scores. And so if you calculate like, let's say the, the income for Dallas, right? There's like three professional sports teams in Dallas. Okay, maybe more, but at least three that I can think of. Um, that distribution is heavily skewed because there's also still a lot of poverty in Dallas. And so we have a lot of people on the bottom and a couple of really high scores at the top. So they almost always give you the median income. Okay, they also give you median housing prices because of the issues of like one really large house can throw off the mean. So the mean is heavily affected by this tails of the distribution because it's a weighted balancing act. Whereas the median is not affected by those tails. Just one more score on that side. All right. So let's switch from central tendency and talk about dispersion. Dispersion is a fancy word for variability. And we're gonna talk about a couple of types of variability. So there's several ways to calculate dispersion statistics. And this is gonna carry over into next week's lecture. So I'm gonna show you the, the formula is usually for the, um, the, the population here. And then next week we'll talk about, well, we are just collecting samples. Why wouldn't we use the sample formula? And my answer is everyone uses the sample formula except textbooks. <laughs> so <clears throat> usually dispersion statistics are tied to or added to a measure of central tendency, usually the mean. Okay? to really give you more than one number. So I have an average score, okay? but then I'm gonna tell you how much it varies around that, that average score, which is really good. Okay? And so this measure of spread gives us kind of a, a good feeling for how useful our central tendency number is. Okay? So if I tell you, okay, it's a one to five scale, let's go from one to five. So it has a, a limited range of numbers that could be. I told you the average was 3.5. Cool. And then I told you the variability, the spread, oops, sorry, the spread of the data was 0.2. That means that everything is very close to 3.5, right? It only varies 0.2. Okay. Oh, well, that's not quite true, but it mostly varies 0.2. If I told you the spread of the data was one, okay, we got a lot more variability where the scores go up and down a lot more. And so a, a measure of variability can tell me how useful that mean number is. Because if there's a lot of variability in the data, the mean number becomes less um, informative. And so we're gonna focus here on the range, um, the quartiles, variance, and standard deviation being the big two. Okay, mostly we're just working our way up to standard deviation. In the next lecture, we'll talk about standard error and how those two things are related. So the range, well, the range is an easy one. It's the, the, the smallest score subtracted from the largest score. This is handy when you have data that has kind of a limited range and you wanna see if you capture the entire range of the scale. So let's say on our one to five scale, if all the scores are three to five, we know that people aren't using the one and the two, that kind of thing. However, the range is very biased by outliers, so scores that are way at the ends of a distribution. And there's a couple of ways to calculate the range. Now, what some people do is they just rep report the min and the max. Okay. And so that's what the range function does. Notice here, we're still using our vector of data. Okay. You can see the range was from four to 6.4. Now, in other Places what you'll see is the range is actually the top minus la the bottom minus the top. Okay. So you could report this as the range is from four to six point four, or the the min is four, the max is six point four, with a range of two point four. If people don't want to math themselves, okay. 
I think I generally see people talk about the min is this, the max is that. If you want the math, do the math, right? But if you say the range is 2.4, that doesn't necessarily help you understand the entirety of the scale, if that makes sense. So I told you the range was two points on a one to five, you'd be like, which two points? <laughs> right? Is it one to three, two to four? So let's say the min was three and the max was five. That makes a lot more sense. Now, another one that's really handy is the interquartile range. And the interquartile range is the difference between the first and third quartiles. Well, what the heck is a quartile? Well, quartiles where we take the data and we split it into four parts. That gives us three numbers, right? So we've got the min, it actually gives you five numbers. The min, the max, and then the separator spots. So to break it into four chunks, we get three numbers because it goes from the min to the first quartile, the first 25% of the data. This, that is the first quartile number. Okay. From the uh, first quartile to the median, okay, which is considered the second quartile, okay, because it's a second number. And then the median to the, the third quartile, 75% of the data. That gives you the third quartile. And then the third quartile to the max, which is technically 100%. So you get five numbers, 0, 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100. But these are called quartiles because we've broken it into four parts. Okay. And the interquartile range is the subtraction between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. This is really popular for especially, especially skewed data because the skew tends to happen in the bottom quartile or top quartiles. Okay. And that will tell me, so if I have the median, as my statistic, generally people report the interquartile range as its spread. Okay. And that gives me a good feel for how well the median tends is representing. So if they're really close to the median, that means the, the range there is small. So the median is a good number to represent that data. If they're really far from the median, there's a lot of spread in the data. Okay. Now to get IQR, <laughs> you actually very confusingly use a function called quantiles. <laughs> I don't know why. Because technically it's five points, I guess. <laughs> Do you use this quantile function? And you can actually with quantile set it to deciles, like 10 splits or whatever. But if you don't have any other arguments, it automatically will give you the min, the max, the median, eh? and then the court, the two important quartiles. So think about this here. If the median is 4.6 and the interquartile range is 4.3 to 4.9, so the spread here is 0.3, or the spread is 0.6, but it's 0.3 on either side, that is really small on this scale that has 24 different possible points. Okay, that's three points of the 24 possible points. So you know, we're doing pretty good. Now we can also use the summary function. I would, I would say I find this to be the easiest one because it actually gives you the, the same numbers here. So the, the first quartz, zero, 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100%. And then the mean, the mean is just <laughs> stuck in there as well. But the nice thing about the quantile function is you could actually make up your own splits. And the reason you might use five and 95% is for something we're gonna talk about in a little bit, as in the next lecture. Now, what spread or dispersion statistics should I use if I'm calculating the mean? So the range and the um, interquartile range are tied usually to the median. What if I'm using the mean? Well, we might be considering the variance. So remember the formula for the mean is the sum of all the scores divided by n. And so that is actually contained right here in this uh, new formula here. It's the sum of all the scores divided by n. We just have this extra component here. So it's tied to the mean because the mean is in that function. <laughs> okay. Now I'm gonna call this SD squared. Other people just call this S, right? Some people are going to give you more specific. This is actually sigma. And I just want to highlight, and we'll come back to this in the next lecture, that 
often this formula is not n on the bottom. So if you search variance formula, more than likely you're gonna see n minus one on the bottom. We're gonna talk about why n versus n minus one in the next lecture. So if this formula is for the population, you know every single number possible that you're interested in, use n. If the formula is for the sample, you know, it's a, a, a group, a set from the population, use n minus one. And there are reasons why, but that's saved for the next lecture. So back to what is variance overall? Well, it's the, the average of the squared deviations from the mean. Okay. So we take the, the each score minus the mean, square them, add them all up, divide by the number of scores. Okay. And we don't really do that because it's a lot of tedious math. Instead, we just use the VAR function for variance. Okay. Now this VAR function here does the n minus one calculation, okay. but that's what we're gonna end up sticking with. So I feel okay telling you it's the VAR function. Okay. Now, why do we square them? Well, remember that the mean is a weighted score, okay? So it is a, a, a balancing act of the middle where the weight is even on each side, not the number of scores, but the weight. Okay. If I take each score minus the mean, what I essentially have is a set of negative scores okay, and a set of positive scores. And they're evenly balanced because that's how the mean works. It's the middle weight of those things. Okay. So if I take each score minus the mean, I have my negative handful and my positive handful, and they're equal. So if I just add them all up, I end up with zero. Okay. So the sum of the deviations from the mean always adds up to zero. Okay. This is just because the mean is a weighted score. It keeps an even amount of things on, oh, even amount of weight of number, numeric value on the positive and negative side. Okay. So when you add them up, it turns to zero. And the math person solution to this particular problem is always to square it. And we're gonna see this a couple of times here in statistics. You just square it. If it adds up to zero, square it. No longer adds up to zero because they become all positive. And now we have a pile of them. And so that's why they're squared. Well, when you square these statistics, it takes it out of the scale of the data. So I know what the scale of my earthquake magnitudes is. You know, it ranges from four to 6.4 and it's kind of in decimal increments. So I have a good feeling, but if you tell me that the variance is 0.16, I don't, I don't really know what that means because it's the squared deviations. Um, I usually like to use uh, teacher evals a little bit better for this. So if it's a one to five scale and you tell me that the variance is, Two. Does that mean that it ranges two points? It's square, so I unsquare. It's you know, it's like it's confusing. So uh, variance is squared. So what we can do is just unsquare it, okay? and that's what the uh, the standard deviation is. It's the square root of the variance. This takes that variance score and puts it back into the scale of the data. Okay. So in our case, it goes up to 0.4 because it's a decimal. What does 0.4 mean? And we'll get more into um, kind of z-scores and stuff, but what a standard deviation is, is it's the average amount of spread around the mean, right? So variance is the average spread of the squared numbers. So standard deviation is the average spread of the not squared numbers. And that isn't the whole range of the data because we know that the data ranges from four to 6.4. Okay. This is like, the normal distance from the mean. Okay. So most of the data is between um, one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean. But now we'll take a brief pause because someone rang the doorbell.
All right. So for you guys, it's going to be instant because I'm going to cut this out. But that was FedEx delivering the package to the wrong address. <laughs> so I get to drive down the street after this. <laughs> anyway, where are we at? So we're talking about the average spread around the mean. Okay. So we know the range is from 4 to 6.4. And so 0.4 obviously is not all of that. So this is just, in general, most of the scores. It's actually 64% in normal distribution. Okay, based on z-scores, are between our mean and one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. So if our mean is 4.62, most of the scores are between 4.2 to 5. Okay, so the largest um, spread of the data is. Okay, is that close? Is that a good representation of the data? We'll talk about that more next week. Now, the other way we can kind of talk about distance, right, this spread, this dispersion, is a z-score, okay? Z-scores are standardized scores. So like IQ is technically a standardized score. Okay? Um, but a z-score takes the scale out of the data. Because okay? a lot of the things I've been talking about are like, okay, well, is that a big spread or a little spread? I'm not really sure. Like sometimes it's easy to think in the scale of the data, sometimes it's not. And so what we want to do is convert that data into, sorry, I can hear things crashing outside. It's like a weird day here. Okay, so we can want to convert our, our score that we're interested in into a standardized score so that nobody has to know anything about the scale of the data. I can just say, here's the score and you can immediately know what that means. Okay. So for example, if I want to say um, the snowfall this year is a z-score of one. Okay. Once you have learned what a z-score is, you'll know that like, wow, that's way more than normal. Okay. And so the way we calculate this is take the score we're interested in, x here, each person or each data point minus the mean, you see this looks familiar on the top here, divided by the standard deviation. Okay. Because we're normalizing by the average spread. And if the score is right on the mean, it gets a score of zero. So if I said the average snowfall here, or the snowfall this year was a z-score of zero, you'd say, well, that's as much as you normally get. Okay. You don't have to even know how much you normally get. You just know that that's as much as you normally get. That's the average score. If the snowfall score is positive, that means it's more than normal. And if it's negative, that means it's less than normal. So this is a really nice solution to like kind of trying to interpret, um, you know, where the point falls. And so let's see, we can actually calculate those in R using the scale function. Okay. And so if I just calculate, I added them to the data set okay. and I just said, oh, show me the top ones. Okay. So this first one is a stronger magnitude than the mean. This one is less than the mean. This one is way more than the mean. So this is one of our highest scores. And now the cool thing about this is this function, when you run it and you save it, it actually saves the attributes that it used to create those scores. So it saves what it calls the center, which is the mean. So it should look familiar, 4.62. And then it saved the scaling factor, which is the standard deviation, just 0.4. So it actually inherently kind of saves um, what the mean and the standard deviation were for you. And I just printed them out getting down here at the bottom so that you could see that that's what it's doing. Okay. So these scores are really helpful when we want to compare different scales to each other. So if you're using, you know, income um, and you're trying to compare maybe something like cost of living, like in New York to the cost of living in Missouri, very different <laughs> having lived in both of these now. <laughs> so if I wanted to compare the cost of some sort of food item, I might have to standardize them first based on the cost of living, because then it, there's no real comparison there. New York always wins. 
Um, and so the properties here is that the, the numerator of that equation represents the distance from the mean. So positive scores are higher than the mean, negative scores are less than the mean. This should sound familiar. It's kind of the way that skew with kurtosis values kind of work. By dividing by the standard deviation, we're setting a scale to express it in units of standard deviations. So one means one standard deviation more than normal. A negative value indicates below, positive is above. Sorry, I was repeating myself. Um, some other properties. This is where it gets really good. Okay. So we can have z-scores that represent a certain proportion of the data. So a z-score of 1.96 is the top 2.5% of the data. A negative 1.96 is the bottom 2.5% of the data, which represents 5% of the data. So if you want to know if a score is um, different from 95% of their data, you would look for it on the edges. Right? So the way I always think about this, and we'll, we'll do this a little bit more in the next lecture, is a race car. Okay. When I'm trying to support some sort of statistical analysis, I start myself in the middle. My little race car is in the middle. It could go either way. It's a fancy race car. It could go forwards or backwards. <laughs> and I start on zero. So I start at the mean. And my race car has to cross some finish line. Okay, finish line depends a lot on the type of data that I have, the type of statistic that I'm running. Am I running a t-test? Is that an ANOVA? Is it a correlation? What is it? But I have some distribution that I'm interested in. So the cutoff score might change. But for a z-score, it's 1.96. And my little fancy car revs up, and then we run the study, and we see how far the car goes. If our fancy car crosses the the cutoff score that we've made up, then we might say it's significant. And okay, we'll get to this more in the next lecture, kind of preview for our next topic. Um, <clears throat> if it doesn't cross that line, we would say it's not significant. Okay. And so the purpose of this idea of understanding the, the central tendency and the spread of the data is all about calculating these these percentages and proportions. Because with the normal distribution, we understand how much of the data falls in each little range. Right? So the diff between the mean and one z-score is 32%. Okay? And so if you add the negative one z-score, that's where I was getting that 64% number. Okay? And then between one and two is another 14%. Okay? So between two and two, negative two and two, this will come up a lot this semester. We've got like, hold on math, 96% of the data. Cause so it's 1.96 to get 95% of the data. And then 95 is kind of this weird special number that we'll get into in the next lecture. Um, it's kind of this fancy magic voodoo number, but we could pick any point we wanted. So the whole kind of like winding path here to understanding is that we use what we know about a distribution, it's skew, it's kurtosis and all that stuff. It's, if it's a normal distribution, we know what its properties are mathematically. And we can use that to help us understand the importance of a data point. So if I know like COVID, especially stuff that's going on right now, when people tell you today is the highest day of COVID deaths or whatever, and you just kind of get this fatigue from all these numbers they're throwing at you. but if they tell you that like this is in the top 1% of days that we've had, that sounds like, wow, that's crazy because it's the, the highest score. Well, they're calculating that number using these kind of standardized scales. Um, we could also do 99%, it's 2.58, okay? And 99.9% .9 is 3.29. So these scores kind of taper off fast. Now, can I get a z-score of 10? Yes, the likelihood of this is very low though. Okay, unless it's made up examples, because I'm really bad at making up examples sometimes <laughs> where they ha don't have crazy z-scores. And let's end this lecture with the last kind of measure that we can use. Everything we've done so far has been with one variable. Okay. And we'll cover correlation in its own lecture on a different day, but um, what if I have multiple variables? Now I can start to talk about their relationship, their, their spread and their variance with each other. And so two variables 
have a relationship together if they appear to change together. Okay. So if they go up together, if they go down together, if one of them goes up, the other one goes down, that kind of thing. Okay. And you might suspect some sort of cause and effect relationship if they increase together or decrease together. However, you have to be real careful because there are many things that go up and down together that have that aren't actually related or they're related through what's called the third variable problem okay, where they're both actually related to something else. There's two kind of main um, statistics that one can calculate for uh, two variables changing together. The first one is covariance and this is linear. Okay, so if it curves, this doesn't work. Um, between X and Y. And what I really want you to see is that, look at this formula. Okay, so look at especially this half of the formula. It's X minus the mean divided by N. That should look really familiar. It's the first half of the variance formula. But instead of being squared, we've changed it to X minus the mean times Y minus the mean. And so it's essentially the variance formula separated out into X and Y. I used to be able to draw this like cute on the board, but you know, if X is positive when Y is positive, or if X is greater than its mean when Y is greater than its mean, that makes it positive. If X is less than its mean when Y is less than its mean, it's a negative. And then you get this kind of linear relationship that they're going up together. And covariance is the average product of their deviations. So it is variance, but there's two of them. So it's covariance going together. So there's a nice function for this cove. Okay. Now, uh, I looked at magnitude and depth. Okay, so how much do magnitude and depth vary together? Well, it's negative. So as magnitude goes up, depth goes down, or the reverse, as depth goes up, magnitude goes down. <coughs> but 20 points does not mean anything to me. Okay, because it's not squared. <coughs> it's in the scale of the data, but like, I don't, I don't know. Right, meh. So most people instead prefer to use um, correlation. And then here I just left a note about how this is the formula for the population. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the formula for the uh, sample, which is n minus one on the bottom. Now correlation is, is also a measure of linear relationships. It's this standardized covariance. That's all that is. Okay, so we're going to take covariance and we're going to put it into a scale we can understand. So correlation is the z-scores of x times the z-scores of y, basically. And it's measured by that correlation coefficient. Most people have heard of correlation, also known as Pearson's product moment co coefficient. Okay. And the function for that is core. Okay. Now this isn't a scale to understand. Correlations range from negative one to positive one. Zero means no relationship. And anything moving away from zero means a stronger relationship. So point two here means it's kind of a weak relationship between depth and magnitude, and it's a negative. All right, the other cool thing we can do, and we'll use this graph um, for option in our data screening section, is core plot and making a, a really cool um, visualization of the correlations. So the diagonal here will always be these sort of dark blue dots because a the depth correlated with itself is one. Okay. So we're gonna look at everything kind of off diagonal. And we can see here that these are heavily related. Okay, so magnitude and station. Well, station's where it's measured. So this is not a good variable to include. Um, and obviously the z-score is gonna be um, related to magnitude because that's how we created the variable. But it's pretty much like not related, like magnitude is not really related to a specific area of the world, longitude or latitude. Okay. So what if I learned altogether, other than FedEx delivered a package to the wrong address, wrong street, but at least their first name was also Aaron today. But what if I learned in the lecture part, you say? Well, overall, we talked about frequency distributions that help us understand the shape of the data, skew and kurtosis. We talked about central tendency, so the mean, median, and mode, and when to use each one. Then the dispersion, so for 
um, uh, medians, we would use the range and the interquartile range. For mean, we'd use standard deviation or variance. And then a little bit of like multiple variables spread an association with each other, covariance and its standardized friend correlation. In the next section, we're going to get more into like, what do I do with statistics? So we're going to talk about hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, and model fit. So we're going to get in back into building models before we actually start running any specific statistics.